imagine with me that you are a, a peasant, say six or seven hundred years ago, uh, over in Europe, working the king's land and, and scratching out a living for you and your family. And on one day, an emissary comes to you from the king. He approaches you in the field as you're uh, tending your crops there, and he presents you with this beautiful set of clothing and tells you that you are invited to a feast in the king's palace. And so you go home and you get ready and you, you, you get dressed and you make your way to the palace. And once you're seated at the feast, the king looks to you and he informs you that all of your debts are forgiven. And that beyond that, he has decided to consider you as royalty from that day forward. He tells you that, that the purpose of this feast that you've been invited to is for him to explain all these wonderful gifts that he's given you. And to prepare you for these uh, honorable duties that you're going to fulfill in his name. That as you enjoy this feast together, he's equipping you for that this new life that he's given you. Would we be eager to sit at that table and listen to the king from this, this shocking uh, announcement that he's making to us? Hearing about the wonderful things he has in store, or would you say, no thanks, take your plate of food from the feast and leave? That's, of course, a silly question. No one in their right mind would neglect the the wishes of such a, a kind king who's given such honor. And yet when we come to consider the church and, and what it is and, and, and what it does, we would be in a similar situation. In fact, we are in a similar situation with the king of all creation. As we've heard over the last 14 sermons we spent in the Upper Room Discourse, God himself took on flesh. He fulfilled all righteousness. And then he gave his life to satisfy the curse for our unrighteousness. He rose again three days later, ascended to the glory above, and was crowned for our salvation. Also that in his grace he might give us everything he earned. And everything that he deserves is given to us as a gift through faith. We heard that wonderful gospel many times and in many uh, different ways throughout that, uh, that series we just came out of. And that that king has used his authority as he was crowned head of the church. He used that authority to establish and to empower his church. And that church is given to us as the context in which all of his wonderful promises are fulfilled to us ordinarily. And so as we move toward acknowledging ourselves to, to be a local church and consider that and, and begin to uh, work together to, um, to, to gather people for that and to, uh, to, to plant, to acknowledge God's work of planting us, if we aren't careful to, to pay close attention to what he's revealed in Scripture about what the church is and what the church does, we can come dangerously close to being like that peasant who takes the gifts and just, and just leaves and ignores the king and his wishes. So receiving the gifts of the gracious king, we're, we're not going to ignore the means through which He's given that we experience those gifts and that we are sustained in them and that we grow in them because he's given us such a gift, not only in, in saving us, but in giving us the church. The church is a blessing from the hand of our king. So in order to understand the mind of Christ for his church and in order for us to uh, move toward planting biblically, we need to consider Scripture as a whole. 
So these sermons in the coming weeks will be a little bit different than in structure, at least, than the ones that we just walked through, because we're going to be taking a survey, Lord willing, of of large portions of Scripture, all of Scripture, even, uh, so that we can get this the, a sense of of the mind of Christ for His church. We need to get the big picture. But let's start by by turning back to where we ended like the last series, John chapter 17. I want us to be reminded of this wonderful church, or sorry, wonderful truth that we heard in John chapter 17. I've already referenced it here, but John chapter 17, starting at verse 1. It says, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. If you'll remember, in that passage, we considered the incredible fact that the God-man, Jesus Christ, our Savior, once he fully accomplished the will of his Father, it was crowned king of all creation. And that Christ has been, in a special sense, given as head of his church. Again, crowned for our salvation. Salvation of his church. He rules and reigns over all of heaven and earth for the purpose of bringing the salvation of his church to completion. He exercises his power and his authority to accomplish that end result. And so... As we consider the church, there are two senses in which Scripture refers to the church. That is the invisible church, sometimes known as the universal church, and the visible church. There are the, when you consider the church, when you see the church in Scripture, it's spoken of in those two different ways. The invisible church and the visible church. The invisible church refers to the entirety of Christ's love gift from the Father. Every man, woman, and child from the moment of the fall all the way back in Genesis to the final trumpet. All of them who have been or will be saved by grace through faith in Christ. Among the Old Testament saints, they were saved by grace through faith in the promise of the mercy of God that was to come in Christ. They didn't know him by name, but they knew the promise. And they were saved by grace through faith in Christ, even without understanding the full picture. And then after Christ, in this age in which we are now, we're saved by grace through faith in the mercy of God in Christ, who has come, whom we understand what he accomplished for us. Another way to think of this, this is the invisible church. Just fast forward all the way to the end. In the, the age to come where, where we are all gathered around Christ's throne, singing his praises for eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. Everyone you see there, that's what we understand to be the invisible church now, here and now. Think of the end result. All those people. That's the invisible church as we understand it now. The entire number who will come to saving faith in Christ. In Hebrews 12.23, the author of Hebrews refers to the invisible church as the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. We call it the invisible church because we can't see the inward working of God in people that results in that final number being, being Christ. It's a spiritual work. It's inward. We as finite people can't see into the spirits of one another. Therefore, it's invisible. But we can see the evidence of those who belong to the invisible church. And that, of course, begins with their profession, their professed agreement with God's law and his gospel. We can't see one another's hearts in an infallible way 
Jesus, speaking to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, told him, I will build my church. Jesus builds his church. And Christ first builds his church by calling sinners by his grace, uniting them to himself through faith, and adding them to that invisible church, declaring them eternally righteous, forgiving all of their sins through his own righteousness and his death and resurrection in their place. Christ builds his church. Christ adds sinners to the invisible church. But those that he brings into the invisible church, he also calls to join together as the visible church. Those who profess agreement with God's law and gospel, those who uh, agree with God in his diagnosis of their sin and are therefore siding with him against it, and who are relying on his way of salvation in Christ, those who profess that, they're what we call visible saints. And those visible saints, we baptize. We see this, this wonderful, beautiful gift of grace in this physical word picture in the waters of baptism. As the water of baptism is, is quite literally taken up out of the pages of Scripture itself and set down into your, your baptistry. And then as that, that sign is, is applied to their physical bodies, we understand that in accordance with their profession, God is preaching over them in that water. Baptism is God's idea. He defines it. He assigns meaning to it in his word, and then it comes into the physical world where it's applied. The waters of baptism don't save someone, but they are, as it were, a sermon that God himself is preaching over the person receiving it, one that you can see and feel and experience with your physical body. God himself is declaring for all to see this person has been united to Christ, buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. They have already passed through the judgment of God in Christ. They've already been dead and buried and now raised. And as surely as the dirt is washed from their physical bodies in those waters, so their sins have been washed away. That's what baptism preaches to us and so we as the church we treat them according to what God has publicly declared in that baptism they are visible saints they're the ones that we have warrant from God himself to consider to be invisible saints based on their profession. And those visible saints make up the visible church. So a person is called to faith, called by Christ to himself. They profess repentance and faith. They are buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. And we as the church look at that profession and that symbol in the waters and take them into the visible church. They are the brothers and sisters that we gather together with to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ together in the local church. The ones we're called to love and serve and cling to as we walk together to glory, trusting in our Savior. So just as Paul address the visible church in Rome. In Romans 1-7, the local church is, is spoken to as those who are beloved of God, called as saints. That's how the apostles spoke to this visible assembly of professing believers, beloved of God, called as saints. 
And so we understand that Christ, as the head and king of the church, wields his authority to give eternal life to those whom the Father gave him, like John said. We understand that the full and final nature of this church is invisible to us. But that Christ gathers his invisible church into visible expressions in this world on the basis of an individual's agreement with law and gospel and and then he owns their profession of faith through baptism. Scripture reveals four main ways that Christ then uses his kingly authority to establish and guide and empower his church. It's the main thing we're going to consider in this message. He calls his church. He institutes his church. He orders his church. And he governs his church. Calls, institutes, orders, and governs. And he does all of this through his mind as revealed in Scripture. And so again, this sermon is, a, is sort of an introduction to the whole topic. We're, we'll, we'll, we'll consider everything we're going to hear here in more detail in the weeks to come. But this is sort of an introduction, the, the big idea of the church. So let's consider the authority of our Savior, again, to call, institute, order, and govern his church. First, Christ calls his church. In 1 Timothy 1.15 Paul tells us, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. As we heard in detail in in the upper room discourse, within the eternal counsel of God, the Father gave the church as a love gift to the Son in eternity past. But every son and daughter of of Adam falls short of the glory of God. None of us possesses the righteousness which God requires if we would have fellowship with him. In and of ourselves, none of us have that righteousness. And God cannot approve of us in and of ourselves. So God's plan of redemption was for the Son to take on flesh, to be born into his own fallen creation, born of a woman, born under the law, as a man like us in every way, tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. The righteousness that God requires of us, Christ, accomplished it. As the Father testified, this is my beloved Son, in him I am well Pleased. Christ alone is well pleasing to the Father. And the gospel is that all Christ accomplished in his perfect life, he accomplished in our place. We, the, the wicked, our beloved sons, well pleasing to the Father in Christ. When the Father looks at us, He sees us in His Son. And therefore, we stand in His righteousness before a holy God. But the approval of righteousness isn't our only need. God, in His justice, must punish all unrighteousness. The curse of His law must be satisfied. And so the perfect Lamb of God was punished in the place of all who believe. The curse of the law which belongs to every law breaker, Christ satisfied it fully. Everything that justice demand, Christ suffered in our place. <clears throat> he willingly subjected himself to death in our place. And he remained under its power for three days in his tomb. His death was our death. Our sin was counted as his sin, though he had no sin of his own. And the death 
that he died while bearing our sin upon himself, that counted as our death. The law says you deserve to die. And Christ died your death. That's what the cross did. Just as his death read the verdict, curse satisfied. So his resurrection three, de three days later read the verdict justified. For every man, woman, and child who receives and rests in Christ as their entire righteousness and as the full satisfaction for their guilt, the Spirit unites them to Jesus. All that he earned, all that he deserves becomes yours by grace through faith. This was the plan of the triune God before time began to accomplish the gathering of his church. This love gift of the Father to the Son. And Christ accomplished it fully, completely. His gospel, his good news belongs to us. And in his grace and in his mercy, Jesus holds out his hands through the preaching of his gospel and calls all sinners to come to him and rest. To enter his covenant of grace through faith. To be united to him as, as the head of, of the covenant that, that of grace. To hear the Father declare over them righteous in the righteousness of Christ. To receive the forgiveness of sins in him. Christ invites every son and daughter of Adam to that salvation through his gospel as it's preached. Listen to this. John chapter 10, verse 11 and then 14 to 16. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will hear my voice. And they will become one flock with one shepherd. You hear that? Christ calls his flock by his own voice in his gospel as it's preached by the preacher's that he sends. He gathers his sheep into his fold. Christ, another way to say this, Christ gathers his invisible church to himself. He calls them, both Jew and Gentile. He gathers and calls them and gathers that invisible church into visible local bodies, coming together to rest in Christ and to to, to grow in our pursuit of obedience to our Lord. Jesus uses his authority to call his church to himself. And the second way he uses it, he also uses his authority to institute the local visible gathering of believers. One of the clearest passages in scripture that we see of Christ instituting this visible gathering of believers would be the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. It says this, Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Our king has been given all authority, he says. And he sends preachers into the physical world to preach his gospel, to baptize disciples, and to gather them together, to grow in unity under his word and at his table. 
And he promises that his presence is with us as we gather. So it's a visible gathering where these things take place. Christ instituted that gathering. After the Spirit came on uh, the day of Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out on the, the gathering of disciples there. And Peter stood and preached the first gospel sermon after the Savior's work was finished. And we read about how the Spirit gathered those who believed into the first visible body. We read about that in Acts 2, 41 and 42. It says, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Now listen, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so on day one of, of the Spirit being poured out and, and, and the first... Uh, sermon of gospel clarity after Christ was preached Christ called people to himself and gathered them into this visible body that he instituted so those whom Christ calls they, they willingly gather themselves together with others that Christ has called to be fed the word to pray and to fellowship with one another and that Gathering which Christ instituted and, and brought together by the power of His Spirit, that's continued to this day. Still, those He calls, He calls to willingly gather themselves together, to, to grow in Him, to fellowship and love one another. This willing gathering of the saints is the context in which all of the promises of Christ are ordinarily fulfilled towards his people. The church is important. It's where we come together to receive Christ's gifts, to grow in our dependence upon him and his grace. And as we learn to obey in gratitude, to obey our Lord in his, in his uh, kindness towards us. And it's to get th these gatherings that most of the epistles of the New Testament are written, right? Romans, written to a church, a visible church. Ephesians, to a local gathering of visible saints. The local church is Jesus' idea. He instituted it. He doesn't just call and gather people uh, into a church he instituted. He doesn't just call us and leave us to figure it out. He also gives order to the visible body. He orders this visible church. That's the third thing to consider here. Christ has revealed in his word everything that a local church needs to order themselves according to his mind and to fully carry out their purpose in his power. Matthew 16, 18 to 19 it's a pretty familiar passage probably to you that you, pro you might have heard Roman Catholics uh, abuse this verse to teach that the Pope is the head of the church. And of course, it teaches no such thing. Matthew 16, 18 to 19, uh, Jesus speaking to Peter, he says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. We actually already saw the result of these keys that Christ gives to Peter. Jesus tells him he's giving him the keys to the kingdom of, of heaven. And tells him that he will build his church upon him. And what do we see Peter do? What's one of the, the, the first acts of Peter after Christ's ascension here? Acts chapter 2. The Spirit descended on the gathered disciples. And Peter stood up in the assembly that was gathered there. And he preached the gospel of Christ. 
And as he stood and proclaimed Christ, that was Peter flinging the gates of heaven wide open through the gospel. And those gates haven't been shut ever since. Peter used the key, the keys by proclaiming Christ. And the gates of heaven were opened through his passage. And remember, 3,000 souls entered those gates that day. The Spirit called men and women to Christ through his preaching. And he gathered them together into a local body where they sat under the apostles' teaching and prayed and fellowshiped. That's the church. It was built on Peter. And as the first one to use those keys by preaching Christ. And every local church since then has followed from Peter's use of the keys that Christ gave him. And those same keys are used to this day. Christ has entrusted the local church with the task of proclaiming the same message Peter proclaimed. And that message is still the keys which open the gates of heaven to sinners. And again, don't miss this. That happens in the local church. We use the keys to open heaven to sinners as a local body. We are tasked with the responsibility then of, of hearing their, their profession of agreement with law and gospel, their profession of faith. And the local church is tasked with baptizing them and adding them to the visible church. That is a, that's, a, that's a big deal. Local churches have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. They use them by preaching Christ, and then they have the responsibility of, of adding all who come to their visible body. But Jesus also charges his church to use those keys to protect herself. There's a positive side and a negative side to the use of the keys. Not negative meaning mean, but negative meaning where we add and subtract. He's charged the church to also close the gates to those who would seek to destroy the visible church. Matthew 18, starting at verse 15, Jesus says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Did you notice the phrase there? The familiar phrase. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. That's the exact phrase, right? That Jesus used with Peter to describe those keys that he gave him. Just as Jesus entrusts the church with the keys to add to the visible body... So he instructs them to use the same keys to remove from the body when there are issues that threaten the church. Right? Remember from the Upper Room Discourse, we are in a hostile environment. We're faced with a very real enemy. And rather than seeing his visible bodies torn apart, their unity destroyed, and the, or the purity of their body thrown away, Christ says, no, I have authorized you to act on my behalf according to my word to handle the affairs of the church. That's the ministry of the keys 
And when we consider the order that Christ has given to the church, the way he orders us, there's really no greater responsibility we have. So if he gives us what we need in order to carry out the biggest task, of course we have everything we need to, to order ourselves according to his mind for the smaller task. He gives us everything we need to fully accomplish his purposes for us. Again, we'll look more closely at all of this in the weeks to come. But we've seen the power of Christ to call, to institute, and to order his church. But now we see his power to govern his church. As we can see from, from what we just heard, Christ has given his authority, his own authority, to the local church to operate as he's revealed in scripture when we consider the church's responsibility to restore brothers who are stumbling or or who are trying to tear up the church the local body when we consider our responsibility to come alongside them in patience and love and say you can't destroy Christ's church here or if they won't hear it, to put them out of the membership if they refuse to be restored. That's an enormous responsibility. The final step in that process, you remember what it was, what Jesus said? Tell it to the church. And the church itself is then to decide the case according to the, the word and the presence of Christ in our midst, in the local body. The congregation itself has been inf invested with the power of the keys from Christ. Given all the authority that she needs to carry out the will of Christ in the church. And it is the mind of Christ that the church use the authority that she's been given to call officers. To carry out the tasks the scripture gives them in the church. So Christ has invested authority in the, the local body as a whole, in the congregation. And that congregation is to then recognize Christ's appointment of pastors and deacons in his church. You see, Jesus is the one who appoints the pastors and deacons in the local body. He does that by, by gifting individuals, by, by qualifying them for ministry, and then by calling them, by giving them the desire to serve in that way. None of that happens by accident, you know, in, in, a, in a, a, a biblical church. That is Christ making his grace evident in pastors and deacons. And it's then the church's responsibility to respond to his work in gifted individuals and to use her authority to recognize and call the ones that Christ has given. Paul, speaking to the pastors of the church at Ephesus, said this in Acts 20:28. 20, he said, Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The Spirit himself gives pastors and deacons to local churches and he, he charges them by his word to carry out the ministry of the word and to shepherd the congregation as the congregation willingly allows them to do that, to do what they've been called to do. Deacons are, are similarly uh, given by the Lord and are empowered, authorized by the church to make sure that the church runs smoothly and, and that no one's needs are being neglected. And so the local church has been entrusted with Christ's authority to operate as he's revealed. And the church authorizes the officers that Christ gives her to carry out whatever tasks it is he's given in scripture 
So with so that's that's Christ governing His church. That that's uh, His revealed will for the church to willingly call pastors and deacons to to serve according to Scripture. So with the church called and instituted, ordered and governed according to the mind of Christ, what's the result? Why? What what does all that produce? What is the purpose? of all of that, of these local bodies that Christ puts together. The book of Ephesians was largely written to answer that question. We see a picture of of the the result of ministry of the church. Ephesians, oh my goodness, it's a beautiful book. It might need to be one of the next ones we, we go through. But Paul begins the book of Ephesians with this breathtaking summary of the grace of God in Christ. Over a few few chapters, he lays out the the gospel and, and the wonderful gifts we've been given in Jesus. He tells this local church at Ephesus that they've been given every spiritual blessing in Christ now and for all eternity. He tells them how this gift of grace that Christ brought to them was planned before the foundation of the world and was brought to bear in in space and time through Christ's life and his redeeming blood shed for them. Paul prays that this local body would grow in their understanding of all that they have in Christ and that Christ himself would fill them And that they would understand the infinite, incomprehensible love of Christ that they've received. And that out of that love that they've received under the ministry of the word in the church at Ephesus, Paul says that, prays that they would grow in all love and unity and patience and humility and gentleness and peace. That's a picture of the result of the ministry of a biblical local church. And how is that accomplished? Through Christ's gifts in the local church. Through his calling, instituting, ordering, and governing the local body. Here's how Paul describes it to that Ephesian church. Listen to this. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. Paul says... And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects and to him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So hear, hear what he's saying. He's saying all of these, these different uh, gifts and offices and, and the structure that Christ has given when it functions according to the mind of Christ, we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. We are made to be like him, together, as one. And the result of that is love, peace, gentleness, humility, and unity around the truth of Christ. So that's that's the result of us coming together under the church as Christ, or as the church, as Christ has established it. Christ has established his church for this purpose. And as we are obedient to function as he's shown us, all the wonderful things 
he's promised will be brought to bear. Because it's not up to the cleverness of your preacher. It's not up to, to how, how uh, you know, how wisely we're able to figure out how to attract people. It's not up to that kind of thing. It all rests on the faithfulness of God himself who has promised to build his church, to keep his church, to fulfill every promise he's made in the church as we gather. All the wonderful things he's promised will be brought to bear. And as we are assembled according to, to the mind of Christ, we will be a visible outpost of the kingdom of God. A place where the people of God cling to Christ together and love one another. Where the world finds that the gates of heaven are opened wide to them in this gathering as Christ calls them through his gospel. So again, as we move toward considering and, and planning together to plant as a church, uh, the plan will be to focus on these various elements and, and others over the weeks to come to see the mind of Christ according to his word so that we can come together as a, as a biblical body and we can look to see his precious work in us and through us in Andrew.